What's up, everybody, and welcome to a special bonus episode, a bonus episode, if you will, of Team Chat Podcast, a video game show where we talk about video games, the ones we love, the ones we hate, and everything in between. I'm one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined across the power of the internet by my co-host, Rachel Mogan. Bonjour now. Bonjour to you as well. And our special guest for this bonus episode, my brother-in-law and very, very good friend, Michael Boyd. Yay, Michael. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to the show. You were back on, I don't remember now the episode it was exactly that you were on the first time, but we talked about like Assassin's Creed and a lot of fun stuff there and some other stuff uh, and some, uh, and how that series and what it's meant to like me and you. And so a lot of, we actually talked a whole lot about some varied gaming topics on that episode. So it was pretty fun. But now Michael is back joining us today for this bonus episode because we are here to talk about the Legend of Zelda. As you all know, or may, might have missed, that February 21st was The Legend of Zelda's 35th anniversary. It's 35th birthday. My God, that is crazy. Yeah, holy crap. That we, we are starting to get video games that are nearing 40 years old. Like, oh my God. You know what I mean? That's crazy. And uh, Michael was actually the one who brought it to our attention that, hey guys, this is coming up soon. Do you want to do something about it? We were like, oh. Yeah, I guess we probably should. should. So we asked Michael to come on and join us because he is a big fan of the series as well. And uh, just to kind of talk about our favorite memories, uh, games, whatever we want to talk about, really, about The Legend of Zelda. Uh, obviously, this is a little delayed. We wanted to get it out closer to the actual day. But, you know, that big, huge winter storm rolled through and kind of screwed up storm. everybody's shit. So we are getting it. We're getting to it better late than never so uh quick little other intro stuff to the show if since this is a normal uh, this is a bonus episode usually episodes come out on tuesday mornings 9 a.m central time and you can listen to those on podcast services around the world wide web or watch a video version of the episode over on our youtube channel you can find us on social media such as facebook twitter and instagram you can join our discord server and talk about a lot of topics gaming and non-related gaming topics with us when we're not there when we're not here recording the show and uh you can also support the show over on our patreon patreon.com com slash team chat podcast whereas for as little as a dollar a month you can support the show and in return we'll give you cool perks like in the episodes early before their general tuesday release and also because it's a brand new thing that we're pretty excited about we're sponsored now by bowed up and so bowed up is make some delicious uh food and they're just gonna try to get a little time here while i pull up the the copy oh, for okay. that that i should have done well i should have done before but i got it now because this episode of Team Chat Podcast is brought to you by Bowed Up. Bowed Up is a modern Asian brand that combines traditional bow techniques with more modern and Texas-inspired fillings. Just like in our in our episode last uh, week when we had Bowed Up for the first time, I got that Texas trio with a brisket bun. Oh, so good. Delicious. And then some like fried chicken and stuff like that. Their goal is to provide a very convenient experience with satisfying food and they deliver. That is the Team Chat guarantee right there. They deliver because it is delicious food. So... Yeah. We're, we're sponsored now, which is really cool. So all that out of the way, let's get to talking about the legend of Zelda. Who wants to kick us off? Yeah. Or so... actually, wait, sorry. Michael's got to introduce himself again. Oh, <laughs> we talked about this before we even started recording. So Michael, I know you were on an episode before, but just give us a, a quick little refresher about who you are, uh, what kind of games you like playing, your favorite game of all time, kind of stuff like that, just so people can kind of get an idea about you. Yeah, so those of you, uh, you might remember me. I was on a podcast. It was like literally almost actually over a year ago now. And we just talked oh, about that's right, random like just gaming a year. stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was pre-pandemic. So, you know, because it was when we were allowed to go to Austin. So, Ooh, yes, and hence why my hair is longer because I haven't had to go anywhere. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so anyway, um, gaming has been a huge part of my life. Uh, just in the beginning, uh, my brother always played games, and he's eight years older than I am. And so, you know, he had access to the Nintendo 64, Super Nintendo, and all that. And so I was exposed to games uh, very early on, and that's just kind of carried through. Last time I was on the pod, I said Shadow of War was my favorite game of all time, and that was really stupid. Um, you? <laughs> I had played a lot retake, of retake, games. redo. <laughs> so uh, I would say that. As of right now, which I still am very behind, I mean, I haven't played a lot of the newer PS4 games yet, but 
uh, I would have to say Horizon Zero Dawn is probably my favorite game of all time. Uh, mainly just because, <laughs> mainly just because it's the first game that I ever played where I played as a woman. Because uh, growing up in a more conservative home, it was like you have to play as a male because you're a male and all these yeah. things. And so it's like just to have that different background and like learn say, hey, you can relate to this character even though they're not exactly like you. Um, and the game was also just beautiful and so well done. Excellent soundtrack. All of it was incredible. And so rehashing that one, Horizon Zero Dawn, as of right now, favorite game of all time. Nice. Sure. Oh, it's a great choice. Great no choice. offense to Shadow of War, but I literally don't think I've ever heard another person list Shadow of War as their favorite game of all time. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's were, like, definitely the in, the, in the top 10 still. Yeah. That, that's exciting. It's still in my top 10. Nice. But yeah. Doesn't belong Very cool. in, in Very the cool. all time category. Nice. Well, okay. Now we can jump into talking about some Legend of Zelda goodness. So who would like to kick us off with some of your memories or favorite games just or general thoughts about Legend yeah. of Zelda? So let's start back at the very beginning. So because oh, this is that. a celebration of the Legend of Zelda's history, you know, it's 35 years old. That's a major milestone. I do just want to give people the briefest background. If you're not familiar with the series and where it started, where it's been, the Legend of Zelda is a high fantasy, that's a little generous, high <laughs> fantasy action adventure video game franchise created by the greats of Nintendo, Shigeru Miyamoto and Tak. Takashi Tezuka. I really hope I said that as well as I can. It, although the series has been primarily developed by Nintendo throughout its history, occasionally a few of the portable installments primarily have been, uh, and some of the re-releases, have been outsourced to Capcom, Vanpool, and Grezzo. Uh, so the game is mostly like an action-adventure style with some RPG elements to it, and it typically follows the story of Link, who is the main playable character in most cases, uh, intertwined with Princess Zelda, one of the members of the Hyrulean royal, fa royal family, and the eternal bad guy of the series, uh, Ganon and or Ganondorf, depending on your persuasion. Uh, the series actually started way back on the Famicom, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's this wild little device from back in, what, 19, 1986. The first game, The Legend of Zelda, uh, the first of the series, was released in Japan on February 21st, 1986, on the Famicom Disk System. And the second game as well, um, The Legend of Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, was also released on the Famicom the next year in 1987. Since then, there have been so many <laughs> releases uh, from The Legend of Zelda leading all the way up to the most recent game. It kind of depends on whether or not you think of it as canon or not. Technically, the most recent one is Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, which just released last November um, in 2020. But some people don't think of Hyrule War Warriors as being in the canon. So if you were looking at the timeline of which games are considered like core canon games, it goes. You ready for this run through? The Legend ready. of Zelda, The Adventure of Link, A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Ocarina of Time, Link's Awakening DX, Majora's Mask, Oracle of Seasons, and Oracle of Ages. Four Swords, The Wind Waker, Legend of Zelda Collector's Edition, Four Sword Adventures, Manish Cap. Both of those came out in 2004, by the way. You normally don't get two releases in one year. Twilight Princess, Phantom Hourglass, Spirit Tracks, Ocarina of Time 3D, Skyward Sword, another two year. That 2011 was a good year. Wind Waker HD, A Link Between Worlds, Majora's Mask 3D, Triforce Heroes, Twilight Princess HD, Breath of the Wild, Link's Awakening, Skyward Sword HD circa 2021 as of yet unreleased. That will be the next official uh, release in the canon. And then of course, at some point in the, I, I don't want to say near future and jinx it, at some point in the future, Breath of the Wild 2 is going to come out. But that's uh, that's the briefest rundown of The Legend of Zelda I can possibly give you. <laughs> so There are a lot of games. Holy there, shit. I don't think I realized there were that many games in the in the series. And that's not even counting some of the most famous and infamous <laughs> installments in the series. How familiar are either of you with the Zelda CDI games? I had no idea there was even a thing. Oh, but I didn't know about them until researching for this pod. <laughs> Dude, just go Google them. Uh, game Grumps actually did a 
hysterical playthrough of that particular installment into the franchise. It's just rock solid gold insanity, which is why a lot of people <laughs> don't consider it part of the canon. Uh, and then, of course, interspersed throughout all of this, it does need to be said that um, although the composers have changed every now and then, the primary composer for the Legend of Zelda series is Koji Kondo. Uh, one of the absolute greats of video game soundtrack fame. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's The Legend of Zelda. And my personal first Zelda game would have been Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. I'm pretty sure it wasn't even the Game Boy Color because it was in black and white and it was really hard to see in the daylight. <laughs> And then it at was, night too, when you're driving in the car and yeah. you're just waiting for the street lights to go by, so you're like, "Oh, I can make this move." <laughs> yeah, you can't really see it. Um, and that was I was even young enough at the time that I was one of those people who was like, "Oh yeah, this is Zelda, the little person I'm playing right now in the green. That's right. Zelda. This is Zelda." Okay, and then but eventually, honestly, though, yeah, if you're honestly Zelda, though, like who who could all of us raise our hands in all honesty and truth and know that the character you were playing when we were first started playing legend of Zelda games, we all thought the character's name was Zelda. I, I can, I was one of those kids. Yeah. Wow. Michael showing us off. Okay. Well, okay, fine. In my defense, <laughs> I was very young and I just didn't know better. And then eventually one of my friends was like, you know, that's link. Right. And I was like, who, <laughs> what now? I don't, I don't honestly remember how old I was when I figured out that it was not Zelda and it was link again. Like I, I will say, just getting into this discussion, I don't have as big of a history with these games as you as either of you do. And so I probably was a little bit later in the curve, in the learning curve. It was honestly probably when I started playing Super Smash Brothers. That's when I probably figured out, oh, that's not Zelda. Okay, oh, it's, that's a it's little Link. Much. <laughs> it's Link. That's a that little the first, But that would have been the first game, though, where you where I like picked him and specifically saw Link whenever uh... you selected him. That's really funny. I wouldn't so. even have made that connection. Uh, so, Michael, what was your first Zelda game? So, it's it's a little bit um, split apart because the first Zelda game that I remember playing was... Uh, let me look. I have it all written down. It was A Link to the Past on the SNES. Good um, choice. And so, I have... Uh, earliest memories of that because my brother played it before I did and so I have memories of watching him play and then uh whenever I was a kid you know I would just derp around I never I still haven't ever beaten that game um same with Link's Awakening I have that one on Game Boy um and haven't beaten that one either so like all the the top down ones like if I've played them at all I haven't actually completed them it was just from when I was a little kid and I would just derp around slashing at monsters and stuff um, but yeah, that is the earliest one that I remember, um, but we can wait till later to talk about the foundations and stuff, but yeah. Uh, I will say in your defense, Link's Awakening in particular, I think it's the second to last dungeon. It might be Turtle Rock was so hard. When I was a kid, Turtle Rock was unbeatable. So I didn't actually beat Link's Awakening until they re-released it on the Switch. So oh, wow. I've actually beaten that one, but I didn't beat the one on Game Boy. I was I was I was a kid. I was like seven or eight. Too stupid for that. So yeah, <laughs> I didn't didn't make it that far, but I sure did try. And while I, like I said, I don't have as big of a history with it. The very first Zelda game I did play was Ocarina of Time. And it was mostly just playing it over at my cousin's house because he had the N64 and I could and I could play on it there. <laughs> Um, and so, but honestly though, like the amount of play time I probably had in that game total is probably around like two, maybe three hours. And I really don't even remember getting farther than, oh, I'm, I'm getting confused in my head. I want to call it the Ginso tree, but that's not right. That's it. You want to call it what? That's in, that's Deku or tree. in the blind forest. That's or in the blind forest, what they call Deku the big, tree. the big, like sp- spirit tree. What's the tree? A Deku tree. Or Deku the Deku tree. tree. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I say Deku. Uh, so um, real quick. I do that's just that's what I remember, like fighting the spiders in there. And like, on, I, I remember like playing mm-hmm. around in there uh, and a being terrified of the spiders because I still I hated spiders. Even then they were very freaky looking. Isn't that the ones that had like the, the skull? Yeah, on there? Yes. the backs of them look like they're. Yeah, skull. that was scary to little Jared. And, and then I just also remember how damn hard it was trying to hit them with the slingshot and stuff like that. You hit but, them with the slingshot? I tried to anyway. Oh. I, again, I probably wasn't playing it right at all. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting choice. 
I know I probably could hit him with this sword, but I didn't think about that. You well, know, that's okay. Uh, to each their own. That just goes yeah. to show that like your eventual upgrade to Apex, you know, you were just always made for shooters. That's just who that's, that's just who you were. And that's, that's true. okay. It's in my blood. Yeah. It's, it's in, in my gamer blood. blood. Uh, so before anybody gets in the comments and wants to be like, you pronounce everything dumb, too bad. Uh, so I'm <laughs> full of contradictions, even though it is like the land of Hyrule, I say Helians. And I say Helia, like in reference to the goddess Helia, which is part of the canon, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So don't come at me and be like, they're Hylians. Fuck you. I'll say it how I want to. (laughs) And things like Deku and Deku. I've always said Deku. And so there's just, there's going to be stuff that you're going to be like, you're pronouncing it wrong. And that's just too bad. I live my life my way. You live your life your way. So hell yeah. yeah. Stick to those. We're a sponsored podcast. Stay off the mentions. <laughs> yeah, get, get out of here. We're sponsored. <laughs> now, I will say that as far as um, the Legend of Zelda in global context goes, I think for most people, uh, most fans of the series can say that Ocarina of Time was the first Zelda game they ever played, and that was definitely the game that put the Legend of Zelda on the map in the mainstream it would it's probably a tie between ocarina of time and a link to the past which is still a game that holds up incredibly well that game doesn't even need a port it doesn't even really need a remaster it still holds up as well as it did back in whatever year 1991 it came out in 91 uh back when it came out in 91 so a link to the past and ocarina of time i think are what most fans would consider to be the the cornerstones of the series and kind of setting it up for what it would eventually become. Uh, Me personally, I didn't play Ocarina of Time until way later. I started with the handheld games and that kept up for a long time for me. Um, It went from a link Link's Awakening to Oracle of, I think I either had seasons or ages. It's whichever one was blue, which I think is ages. I hope <laughs> I might be wrong about that because I was like, oh, I like the blue one because it, it, it kind of they pulled a Pokemon where they released two versions side by side and one was red and one was blue. And I was like, blue, got to go with blue. From there, I went to the DS games. Uh, no, from there, I actually would have jumped to Wind Waker. Uh, Wind Waker on the GameCube was the first Zelda game that I can remember playing where I actually had enough mental faculties to be able to think it through and realize what was happening and actually get a lot out of it as like a forming person, as a young person actually starting to have some critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Uh, And from there, it would have gone to the DS games, uh, Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, and then, of course, Twilight Princess, Scoured Sword, etc. So I've played a lot of games from The Legend of Zelda. I haven't played all of them, especially not not the first two. Well, I mean, I'm that like, list was insanely long of yeah, games. If you have played all of them, that would be a major accomplishment. I've played <laughs> the majority, so I'm going to go on ahead and count that as a win. Hashtag true fan. Uh, sure. I think there's some definite like underrated installments from this list, uh, but I basically wanted to talk about kind of my top three. Um, and I know that Michael has played quite a few games as well. So, Michael, do you want to start with like what, what what your personal top games from The Legend of Zelda are? Well, I'll start with an honorable mention first. Um, because this one doesn't really make it in the top three uh, just for my personal list. But it, it does have to go on a list. And it is Ocarina of Time. Um, Because that one just holds more of a nostalgia factor for me. Uh, It is the one that I, aside from, you know, it's not the earliest one that I remember playing, but as far as being older and actually sitting down with the controller in my hand and not just watching my brother play, it is one of the first. Um, But what's funny about it is, so I didn't actually complete the game until I was like 15 or 16. Because when I was playing it as a younger child, I was terrified of the wall masters, which oh, are, you know, those hands yes. that come from the ceiling and grab you. That is perfectly so understandable. A, yeah. So I never made it past the uh, the forest temple um, when I was first playing it. So as a kid, all that I would do is I'd go to my brother's save file. And, you know, since he had beaten the game, it would just start you at Ganon's castle. Mm. And so I would just fight Ganon over and over and over again, or just derp around Hyrule Field. Um, 
And so that's why that one still holds a lot of this nostalgia factor, um, just because it is one of the very first games. Like, I would say the Ocarina of Time is the game that got me into video games. Um, Ooh, and so it's, it's nice, still on nice. the list. But as far as my personal favorites of Legend of Zelda, it, it can't go in the top three. But I'll go ahead and start with my number three. And I think it's it's probably Skyward Sword. Um, nice. Cool. I was hoping that Skyward Sword would finally get some recognition because people are like, well, the Skyward Sword remake, who cares? Me. I care. <laughs> people like to shit on Skyward Sword, and I, I don't know why. Um, Me either. It, it, what I love about it is that it combines kind of the two art styles from Twilight Princess and Wind Waker. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there. Um, and then just the storyline, it, it was it was different because, you know, you're, you're not fighting Ganon you're, or slash Ganondorf. Like that is not the main threat. You're fighting this character called Demise, which you later learn is the, you know, he is the manifestation of all evil and whenever you defeat him he gives this big long monologue about how you'll never defeat me and blah 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 and so with it being just so much different um away from from the original you know you don't start with the master sword well technically you do it turns into the master sword but like i was really confused when i first found sky the skyward sword and i was like this is not the master sword what is this trash (laughs) (laughs) it's garbage (laughs) like i don't want this Throw it um, back. <laughs> and so, yeah, just, well, and then, and then, you know, you find out this is all, this all takes place thousands of years prior um, to the, you know, the other Zelda games. And so it just being a, a different take, going in a different direction. Um, and then again, like I said, you know, you're playing it on the Wii. So you've got the, the motion controls, you know, you're actually swinging the sword. You're actually using your shield to defend. Um, I mean, it came out in what 2011 is yeah. when uh, Skyward Sword. So I mean, I was 16 um, when it came out, and so being just a young lad is like where all you want to do is go around chopping down trees with your sword. Like it was, it was just the perfect game uh, for my 16 year old self. Um, and so yeah, it and it also so I'll let the listeners know. All week I listened to it, not every soundtrack. Just the games that I played. So I didn't go through every Zelda, but every Zelda game that I've played to completion, I went back and listened to the entire soundtracks because I was figured we'd probably talk about them. Um, and also, like Skyward Sword has an, a phenomenal soundtrack. It yes, is it freaking amazing. And it also, I mean, it does have the benefit that it being later on that uh, you have access to to you know, better music mechanics and all these things. But I mean, just the base value of the soundtrack itself is gorgeous. And so that also nudges it. Um, it honestly is kind of what nudges Breath of the Wild out for me. Um, as I did, although I did go back and listen to and finish Breath of the Wild soundtrack today. And I used to poo-poo on Breath of the Wild soundtrack. And I always, you know, I said that in, in uh, on the Twitch one time, like I was super disappointed in it. And after going back and listening, um, it is, it is rock solid. Um, It's like, I I would say I like listening to it more as just having it on while I'm working or something, but being in game, I just didn't feel like it was as uh, magnificent as some of the other ones were. Um, But yeah, we can talk about breath of the wild at a, at another one, but yeah, skyward sword number three on my list. I love it. Um, Skyward Sword holds a special place in my heart. It's unfortunately not in my top three, but I thought about it really hard. Things that I personally love about Skyward Sword, Gravitude Crackles, my favorite side quests. They're technically called Gratitude Crystals, but you, you're introduced to them through a child NPC, and she's like, Gravitude Crackles? And I'm like, yeah, that's what they're <laughs> called. <laughs> so Skyward Sword had so much charm and so much effort put into its characters. Like all of the characters Mm. in that game had a ton of personality. They even made Link's personality really adorable. And I felt like he really kind of felt like more of a person than he does in some of the other games. So that was something I really enjoyed about Skyward Sword. I loved the flying, being able to fly around on a giant 
pelican bird? Are they like they're based on shoe like bills? shoe bills? Yeah, yeah they're based yeah. on shoe bills. Which yeah. what a silly bird! What a great choice! Those are weird looking birds. I loved being able to fly around. I honestly loved the mechanic of having uh, Skyloft. That's what it's called, right? Um, your hometown. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. the mechanic of having a home base, like a hub, that you then leave to dive down into the other sections of the world. Uh, I kind of didn't like that the surface world wasn't connected. You couldn't get from one place to another unless you went back to the hub world. But I liked the concept of the hub world. Loved the Guardians. That was one of my favorite parts of the game. Those sections were awesome. They were scary and they were really fun. The designs of the, of the three dragons superb i love it when nintendo gets weird with their dragon designs uh so yeah there's a lot about skyward sword that i really enjoyed it is worth mentioning two things that i found very annoying a fee she is pretty annoying like um and i don't like having my hand held the navis of the world are not for me fee is just as bad as navi so no thank (laughs) you but i liked her as a character just not as a helper uh and the the, the music mechanic of using the motion controls to play the harp, I personally struggled a lot with that, but not with the other motion controls. So as far as the combat and using your shield went, all of that went really well for me, but it was the harp specifically that I just, for some reason, I guess I just have no rhythm and I couldn't quite get it right. <laughs> but overall, I think Skyward Sword is a wonderful game and I'm glad that somebody wanted to talk about it. Uh, so I guess I will go with my number three then. And... Mine are going to skew pretty heavily <laughs> into the uh, into the handhelds because I think ultimately when I look back at how much time I've spent with The Legend of Zelda, a lot of it was in handheld. I played the bejesus out of the DS games like nobody's business. And my number three is going to be one of those. It's A Link Between Worlds, which as far as the handhelds go, is almost the number one. It's it's almost the best of the handheld games. Many people would argue that it is the best of the handheld games. What I especially like about A Link Between Worlds is that it is canonically the same exact map as A Link to the Past. So they took an old concept and then just brought it into the here and now and put a new story right on top of it and updated all of the graphics to modern times, which is, you know, you can see the base of kind of the approach of how they um, went about doing Link's Awakening for modern times. I personally have always loved the top-down view. Um, I think that's very, just very much to my play style. I've always liked it. Uh, And as far as the, it's kind of hard to call it combat, (laughs) as far as the (laughs) game mechanics go, uh, the whole concept of A Link Between Worlds is based on you go from 3D to 2D. And how do you mesh a 3D world with 2D parts that form the puzzles and and integral parts of how you get around? So if you're not familiar with A Link Between Worlds, the premise is a mad artist, a mad artiste has shown up in Hyrule and he captures Princess Zelda by turning her into a painting. And you're like, okay, oh. go off, I guess. And Yuga, that's his name, he's something. As far as character designs go, Nintendo was like, what if we smash together a clown, an artist, and a court jester? And then made him evil. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> sure, I guess. So Yuga shows up, he turns Princess Zelda into a painting along with all of the other sages. So the concept of the seven sages is, again, a recurring theme in the Zelda series. Uh, they did it in Ocarina of Time, if I'm not mistaken, and in a lot of the older ones as well. Um, it's part of the... It's part of the just kind of story it always is princess zelda almost always gets turned into stone or some other inanimate object or she gets trapped in crystal and then you have to save her and then there are often sages or fairies or something around the world that you have to go find so a link between worlds did that same thing but because yuga is an artist and he turns princess zelda into paintings he thinks that he can get rid of link the same way Slaps him onto a wall as a drawing, but Link has a handy dandy little bracelet that he got from another mysterious character that Fancy. allows him to A, move around as a 2D wall painting, basically. 
uh, and then slap himself back out of the wall and into the 3D world, not necessarily at will, but at certain points within the world where they're essentially tear between the 3D world and the 2D world. That whole concept. How do you think of this stuff, Nintendo? How do you think of this stuff? Uh, and it was executed so well because a, a kind of weird concept like that could be really bad. It could have been bad. And instead it wound up being a really the most fun aspect of that game. When you combined it with dungeons and with trying to traverse the world um, by and large, it wound up being extremely enjoyable. The only thing that I can say that I found annoying about A Link Between Worlds is that for stupid character reasons, for certain points of the game, you are technically renting all of the weapons and items that you get from a character named, it doesn't matter, Ravio? It's either Ravi or Ravio. I think it's Ravio. In my head, I call him Ravioli, which is why I can't <laughs> remember what his real name is. So he's perfect cute uh so the point is i found that kind of annoying because i i never die not breath of the wild i never die in legend of zelda games except for breath of the wild where i die a lot uh so if you do die in a link between worlds you do technically lose any weapons that you were renting and you have to re-rent them from the guy it's really stupid eventually you get to actually buy them it, it was just one of those things that i'm like this game could have done without this uh, but everything else about the game, the dungeons, the world building, the characters, uh, the dialogue, the dialogue was really charming. Uh, and just the gameplay in general was extremely enjoyable. And I have gone back and replayed A Link Between Worlds four, five times, which for me is more than I finish most other games, period. So A Link Between Worlds is definitely very high on my list. And it is my number three of my favorite Zelda games. Well, my number three, no, I'm just kidding. I don't really like, I don't have enough in this to, in this to be able to have ranked. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in more when we get to talking about breath of the wild, whenever that I would assume hits on one of y'all's lists. Uh, but so Michael though, what would be then your number two? So this is more of a coin flip, but I, I am going to stick twilight princess as number two. Very um, nice. I would put it at my number one, but I'll explain why why it's not later. But uh, Twilight Princess is is one of the first Zelda games that I I played that was like start to finish, just me, didn't need help, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, and so it, it holds a special place in in that way. But honestly, replaying it as an adult, um, like just recognizing how much darker in tone that it is um, really makes me appreciate it a lot more that it's got a more medieval style to it, which, you know, I love medieval history and, and uh, all those things. And so it's just really it's friends, catering you know. to that it is, I mean, we both have swords in our offices. <laughs> I know it's so. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you can see Jared's right now. Jared, your sword is out. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this podcast is not safe for work. Oh no. <laughs> Oh boy! Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, that OnlyFans uh, content. Yeah, that's oh, our yes, Team Chat podcast backslash OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think also, and and a lot of this um, is from replaying it. Like I didn't, I didn't catch all this when I first played it. Um, but upon replaying it when I was older, like recognizing um, how much different it is. Like, yes, you do eventually go to save Zelda, but it, but that's not Link's main motivation at the beginning. It's to save the children from his village and his, you know, first love interest. Um, I pronounce her name Ilya. I, so. I do too, actually. Um, so. Yeah, and so that you know, it not being this, you know, token like, oh, the I've got to go save the princess kind of thing. I mean, and Zelda in that game is actually quite badass. I mean, she She's seems very awesome. regal. Um, like, you know, yes, she is trapped, but like she's kind of like holding herself in just for the sake of the people. Um, and, you know, you have you have uh, huge character dynamics with... Oh, my mic. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> lost my mic. Um, huge character dynamics with guys like Xanth. Um, like the dude's psychotic and yeah. just like playing all of that into there. And of course you, you don't like know that breaks through until you fight him in the end. It's like, then you realize he's just a kid 
you know, who's just been poisoned uh, by Ganondorf. Um, and and uh, this, <laughs> y'all were talking, I think it was two weeks ago's episode uh, with Sleepy Snails talking about, you know, the waifos and waifus and husbandos. When I was re-watching some of the Twilight princess footage oh my gosh i forgot how freakishly hot minna is <laughs> yeah, yeah she's end, really hot <laughs> <laughs> like whenever she like regains her true form all right and how, then do, you I, spell, I, how I do you spell that name spell her name Mid- i gotta look Midna? this up M-I-D-N-A. m-i-d-n-a okay like yeah she's incredibly hot um and so that just made me laugh when i was rethinking uh through a, a couple of weeks ago, the episode of that, and I was like, "Oh yeah, Minda, she would definitely be on the list." Um, but yeah, you had the oh, whole different okay. power structure. Yeah, you see it. I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, I'm picking up what yeah. you're putting down. Again, 2006. I was 11 years old. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, and so just all the different dynamics within the characters. Um, I don't know how you pronounce. It. I just pronounce it Uku. That character freaked me out. The little bird oh man. God, yes. Thing. She is so scary. That thing is freaky looking. But I loved that quest of going up into the sky and fighting that dragon. I, I don't remember the names. Um, I think it's called either... I, I call it the Sky Temple, but I think it's technically called City in the Sky. Mm-hmm. I loved the vibe. Hated that temple. That was my, I loved the boss fight, hard. but the temple itself, my least favorite part of that game. It was so hard. It was very hard. And I think that's one of the other things I liked about uh, Twilight Princess as a whole is just the range of the temples. Like you didn't just have, um, you know, water, fire, forest temple. Like you had the sky, you had uh, the desert temple. Uh, of course you had that in Ocarina of Time. You had the desert and the shadow temples. Um, but the different dynamics the, the zombie things freaked the hell out of me in the desert temple uh or mum, mummies i guess they're not zombies um and then also just the 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 graphics uh you know that was a huge leap for zelda i mean you went from ocarina of time uh you know majora's mask and then wind waker is kind of like you know the big platforms and then you have a completely different art style or rather not completely different but it's more advanced art style with twilight princess um and then, like I said, the soundtrack plays a big role in how these uh, games get put in my rankings. Um, and same thing with that, like incredible soundtrack, um, heavily orchestrated, uh, you know, using strings uh, and all that. And so, yeah, just the, the whole dynamic, I think, honestly, if I were to, to boil it down to three things, like soundtrack, the character dynamics, and then the relationship between Link and Zelda being different than it has been in other games. Um, this, he's just a simple kid, which I know that's how the the game likes to portray it. Regardless, it's like he's just a simple kid that just gets brought up into this huge world. But like, I feel like Twilight Princess accomplished that better of having like truly he has no vested interest in this at all. Like he doesn't know Zelda. He has no affiliation with her um, except that whenever he figures out he's the chosen one. Know, the 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 hero then it becomes a vested interest you know he just wants to go home after he's freed the children from the forest temple he's like okay my job's done time to go and then then it's like actually you owe me and you promised that you would do everything i say unconditionally is the word she uses and so yeah he just again when you're looking at a character that you want to kind of like identify with and you know Take that into your own life, just like someone who um, puts others before himself, even if it if he doesn't have a vested interest in it, it doesn't really benefit him at all, um, just personally. And so him just moving in through that way, um, yeah, just like completely spoke to me. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Another Very of the cool. Zelda games that didn't make it onto my list, but I thought about it real hard. <laughs> I thought about See, it. See, I kind of thought the there thing. was going to be crossover right there because uh, you're talking about Twilight Princess gonna, a lot. I think our number ones might be the same. I'm not sure they will be. Uh-oh. We'll see. We'll see about that. Um, so I love Twilight Princess. Uh, it's one of those games that I think was iconic for me growing up, for sure. I played the heck out of Twilight Princess. 
Uh, and I completely agree that I think as far as its tone goes, the fact that it did try to take, again, just kind of a, a, a darker tone, exactly like you said, uh, from the other games, really sets it apart um, in many ways. The art style was definitely much more grown up, more grown up, a little bit grittier than all of the other games. It also has shirtless Link. He takes his shirt off to sumo wrestle with a Goron. <laughs> that was a formative moment. <laughs> And then the other part is there's a whole tiny town full of just cats. Just a oh, well, there you go. What more do you need? Just cats and one old lady. And I was like, hell yeah, that's where I want to live. <laughs> it also <laughs> continued the trend. I'm not sure if it was technically started in Wind Waker, uh, but it continued the trend of shooting Link out of comically sized cannons. What a wonderful mechanic. Who doesn't want that? So yeah, Link got to be shirtless. There's a bunch of cats. There's a weird thing about this big in, re in real life size that has the head of a human, sort of, and then a bird's body. And then her son is just a flying head with two small wings coming out of it. And their eyes are tiny and they glow red. Uku is scary as hell that creature i don't know how nintendo thought that one up again but uh it, this is also another example of nintendo putting an interesting mechanic into a game because in in case you missed it link turns into a wolf in twilight princess and after a certain point you just get to toggle back and forth between wolf link regular link wolf link wolf link regular link and that's just something that makes it great so yeah i totally understand twilight princess very nice so, Moga, then what is your number two? It I wanna, is. I'm just going ahead and saying this now. I want to try to guess y'all's number ones when we get to number ones. I'm okay. going to try to using my knowledge of both of you. Do you want to try to guess my number two? No, because I think I, I want to know. I want to know what your number one is. And I have like two things and I don't I want to increase my chances for being right. So, no, Michael, I don't want <laughs> do you want to guess? So I. Well, I don't want to say it because if I guess what I think your number two is, then I'll give away my number one. So. Oh, okay, gotcha. I'll, I'll All right, that. I I don't yeah. think I, I don't think you would get it anyways. So this one is like the dark horse of the Zelda series that I will just I I don't get many chances to rage about it, but it deserves its place as an icon of wonderful Zelda games. And again, it's one of the handhelds. It is the best. This one, in my opinion, is the best of the handheld Zeldas. It's the Legend of Zelda Minish Cap. Which oh, I should have guessed that from when we were just talking about yeah, it. Yeah, we just talked episode. about it. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah. asked me, you were like, what's Manish Cap? And I was like, oh my God, you uncultured swine. How could you not know? <laughs> I, I literally, I don't think I'd ever heard it even as a title of a Zelda game before. So and, I think, the, and the thing is, that's completely That's why I didn't apply it with it. I was just like, what is this game? What yeah. is Manish Cap? Uh, so Manish Cap is A, really old at this point. Manish Cap came out back in 2004. This is one of the Game Boy Advance titles. And very notably, it's one of the ones that technically wasn't developed by Nintendo. Manish Cap was act actually developed by Capcom Flagship with Nintendo as the publisher and them overseeing the process. So it's one of those titles that you're like, oh my god, it's technically not a Nintendo like pure original. It was actually developed by an outside team, mm. which is really interesting because it fits thematically, and I'm sure this is because of Nintendo's oversight, thematically it fits straight into the typical Nintendo approach and the um, Legend of Zelda's overall, what's the word for it? Not, not necessarily lore. I mean, I guess technically it is lore, like the game's established lore and its norms. Uh, so the premise of Manish Cap is that Link, young Link, I think he might be a blacksmith's apprentice in this one. I can't quite remember. He's a blacksmith's apprentice in a lot of the games. I don't know what's up with that. Uh, but I, I don't remember what his true purpose was. But the point is, he starts out as just a wee young lad, just a young lad. And he goes to, I think, a festival with Princess Zelda. And she's like, well, yeah, we're having a super good, awesome time playing festival games. And then... Shit goes down and she gets kidnapped, as usual. <laughs> and I don't remember what happens after that. I actually kind of forgot about what happened to Zelda <laughs> in that game. <laughs> because the point is, Link gets turned 
tiny. He gets turned into a little tiny shrug. It's honey. I shrunk the kids, but with link. Nice. So he gets smooshed down real, real small by, um, Vady. How could I forget? Uh, by Vady. He's the big bad of Manish cap. He's this evil sorcerer. So he rolls up. He's got that long purple hair and like the bangs sweeping over one side of his face, covering his eyes. So he's dramatic looking and you're like, Oh my God, who's this edge Lord. So an edge Lord shows up, captures princess Zelda and or turns her to stone. She might be stone in that game. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then shrinks link. So Link, how's he going to get out of this predicament? All of a sudden, he's in a tiny world. The grass rises up around him. Clovers tower over him as trees would. So how's he going to get out of this? He meets a talking hat that is kind of shaped like a duck. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at the uh, the images yeah. right now to kind of like familiarize myself with it. I'm I was not expecting sure. him to have a bird hat. So the hat. I want to say Ezio, but I know that's not right. I think the hat's name is Ezlo. Oh, is that Ezlo. what you just said? Ezlo, yes. So the hat's yeah, name yeah, yeah. is Ezlo. And Ezlo has also been a victim of Vady. Uh, he is actually Vady's mentor, like his teacher, because he was teaching Vady all about sorcery, and then Vady went mad with power and turned him into a hat. Why? unknown but he's a hat and he can't get out of it so he obviously attaches himself to link as video game characters do link always has to have a companion attaches himself to link and then that gives link the ability to go to certain points on the map you can see why i'm a sucker for this mechanic it's just like a link between worlds but with shrinking it's the exact same concept there are certain points on the map where you can find these basically magical waypoints and either go from normal sized world to miniature miniature sized world and vice versa. Where I think Manish Cap just totally knocks it out of the park is one soundtrack. Manish Cap truly had a delightful soundtrack. I still think it sounds good today, um, even though this is an older title by this point. Go just go listen to Manish Cap's soundtrack. It is so charming. And then as far as the world building goes in Manish Cap, they totally embraced the mini world concept. Because unlike in some of the other Zelda games where they, they have a concept like Wolf Link, but then you spend a lot of time not as a wolf in, for example, Twilight Princess or even a Link Between Worlds, you weren't in the 2D world most of the time. It was a way to navigate through the world. That is not the case of Manish Cap. You spend an easy half of the game in the tiny size of the world, which is delightful because there is a tiny race of people that uh, Ezlo and Vady actually hail from called the Picari. And they're just these little, little fairy people. And they, they kind of look like a blend between humans and mice but they're not quite either. And they wear cute little caps and their outfits are made out of like leaves and stuff. And they are so cute. All of their houses are in like pots and things and they use <laughs> mushrooms as beds. And it's so cute. I think I'm such a sucker for cute stuff. And Manish Cap is cute to the 90th degree. It's, a, it's an adorable game. Uh, so yeah, the charm of the world that they created and how well it was done because even, for example, the game mechanics, like let's say that you want to get from point A to point B, but there's water in the way and you are tiny. How are you going to get across that? Link's never been a very good swimmer, even in the best of times. So he can't cross that on his own. Well, what if perhaps you jump on top of a lily pad and then use your gust jar to kind of blow yourself across like you're sailing? So just little things like that made the game really memorable. And even the types of enemies that you fight when you're tiny size. Spiders are suddenly a way different ballpark than they are when you're gigantic. Uh, and there's, I don't know why this was such a big deal for me, but in Manish Cap, there's a concept called kinstones, which is just, it's, it's a nothing collectible. It's just a nothing collectible that the game was like, uh, we'll give them some busy work. You can collect these things called kinstones. And if you find one half that happens to fit with somebody else's other half, something good might happen. So they're just like little halves of coins with different like puzzle cutout shapes. And if you find the other person on the other end of the kinstone that matches yours, you get something. It doesn't sound like it's that cool. 
I loved the Kinstones. I was obsessed with finding all of them, with getting all of their perfect matches. This is a great example of a Zelda game that had really fun side quests. I liked all of them. Uh, so yeah, I don't. I, I wish that I could sell it better to people, but it's an old game at this point, and most people don't have a Game Boy. I think they did. They may have ported it to the Wii U. Like, it may have been available in the Wii U shop. Don't quote me on that. But if it is, and you still have a Wii U, go look for it. Because if it's out there, Manish Cap is a wonderful game. I replayed it many times. I think it had a really fun villain. Uh, and it is so underrated. I think Manish Cap is the most underrated Zelda game. Um, I, I love the other DS titles, Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, but Manish Cap just blows them out of the water by a wide margin. Nice. I mean, I don't understand why you're questioning your ability to sell this game because, I mean, you just described it perfectly. And, like, I'm, I'm looking at the art here and it's I'm even so like, man, cute. the Game Boy Advance games had a special look to them. And I miss that a lot. Yeah, and, like, this, this does look like. I would play it. We'll get a little bit more into why I say that about this one specifically, as opposed to other ones when we talk about uh, breath of the wild, but no, I think, I think you did a fantastic job selling it. So, and I think actually, let me double check my timeline real quick. I have it pulled up here. Oh no, it didn't. Okay. Uh, I had my timing confused. Wind Waker actually predated Manish cap. Cause I was going mm. to say that the stylings, at least in the um, like, promotional art for Manish Cap looked very much like Wind Waker Link, and that's because it, it, it basically is. Uh, but it's a totally different di game, different timeline. Don't worry about it. Legend of Zelda's timeline makes no sense, and that's okay. Not every game has to make sense. There you go. Nice. All right, so Michael, we're going to get to your number one. I'm trying to think. Here. Take a guess. Trying to think. Going to take a guess here. I'm going to go out... Due to my interactions with you on this, I'm going to go ahead and say Breath of the Wild is your number one. Logan, do you have a guess? I was also going to guess Breath of the Wild. Nope, that is not it. Damn it! Um, Breath, of, Breath of the Wild, um, if I were to put it in a top five, it, it would actually go number four. Oh, okay. Um, oh, interesting. Because like when, when I've been streaming it and playing through it, you're like, on everything I've done, you, in the game that you've been watching, you've been like, no, 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 it's here. Or no, 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 like, you need to go get this. Like, you, you're so knowledgeable of it and just, like, all the little corners of it. I was like, this has to be his number one. But well, no, so what, so what is... Bias as well. Do what? Um, number one, and like I said, it's a coin toss between one and two, but it is Wind Waker. Ah. Um, we that do was going to be my guess for, number, for, for yeah, Logan's we number one. Yeah, we finally have some overlap. Wind All Waker right. is my number yep. one forever and always. So let's loop these together, yep. and you two just go nuts talking about these games. Michael, please be my guest. <laughs> Literally <laughs> on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, when I was talking about before as Twilight Princess being like one of the first games that I played you know, completely by myself, Wind Waker is definitively the first game that I ever played by myself. Um, and I honestly, I mean, I don't remember. I know it came out in 2002. Um, I don't know for sure, like, when I actually got it. Um, so it could have been a couple years after that I actually got a GameCube and then and then got Wind Waker. But, um, again, very young. Uh, but having the nostalgia factor of it being, like, this is, the, this is Michael's first game. This isn't Alex's game that has been passed on to him or that he's mm -hmm. seen Alex play. Like, this is Michael's game that he has played. And um, even though like the art style, I, I would put Twilight Princess over it just as personal preference. There is just something about it that is just truly charming. And it is still to this day. I mean, I'll, I play it through the Wii now because I just put my GameCube disc in there. But if I need a feel good game, like I'm feeling depressed. It's been a bad day. I need something that's going to uplift my spirits. I will put in Wind Waker to this day. Um, just the, the art style, the soundtrack is so uplifting, especially if you just go to Outset Island or Dragon oh Root Island. Like, oh, oh, Dragon Root, that, I know that song. That's Dragon Root Island one. is a bop. It's like, a bop. <laughs> and so the soundtracks are, are, are phenom phenomenal, not phenomenal, phenomenal. And then just the, I will say, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Like, I love the sailing mechanic, but I also hate it because it takes forever to get anywhere. Um, like, 
One of my least favorite things in all of gaming is when you have to find the Triforce shards. Oh. The ocean. <laughs> like that will take you weeks. It's so annoying. But I think I was time, one of the only people that was like, oh, yes, it's fine. It's finally time to find the Triforce shards. I love that. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think if I went back and played it, I mean, it's been a couple, maybe a year since I've gone back, maybe a couple years. Um, and I'm sure I'd enjoy it more now. Um, but yeah, again, just the, it, a lot of it is due to nostalgia, but replaying it, looking at the soundtrack, and then also the same thing on that, like, same thing like I said with um, Twilight Princess. Again, Link's investment isn't to go save Zelda. Of course, Zelda doesn't even really exist in this one until later. You know? And so for Link's investment, it's about finding his sister. and that you know doing right by his grandma you know his poor granny she's so tall his poor so grandma she's so <laughs> cute um and so yeah it's like you know I, I need to go find my sister so that my grandma won't die from depression basically oh, no. exactly <laughs> and just like, um like that's link's total investment and of course you know the interacting with uh tetra right that's her name yes tetra, tetra who equals zelda um but being on the pirate ship and then the mechanics of like swinging and your grappling hook, uh, like that was super dope. Um, and then, like I said, art, art style. Um, and and I so I know you mentioned this, like Zelda timelines, like they don't really can. I, I don't know if I've read this somewhere and I've just made it my own. I have like, I'm going to say that I created it. I've like <laughs> created a timeline in which the Zelda games that, again, that I have played because I haven't played all of them are in the same timeline um so like for me i start with ocarina of time and that's it and you basically you can get to twilight princess if link stays as an adult and doesn't return the the master sword at the end of the game but if he does return the master sword um, you go back as a child and that leads you to majora's mask and then that leads you to wind waker somehow the earth is flooded and then you get to wind waker um, and then of course, well, of course, Skyward Sword is, is way beyond all of that. It's, it's at the very beginning of all things. And then, uh, so yeah, then you have Twilight Princess. And then I think from there I connected it to, uh, the Breath of the Wild because I didn't play any of the other stuff in between. And so I always like, liked to find the little connections and the themes, um, between the games. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on some of the things that I loved about Wind Waker so much, but I think so much again too, because I, I was trying to formulate these opinions uh, due to recent knowledge. And so that's why I was going back and listening to the soundtracks and I was watching playthroughs. It's like, well, what was it that I liked about this game as a kid? Um, and yeah, so much of it is that nostalgia factor. So much of it is the, uh, the, the charming aspect of it. And it's like, you know, we all have our go-to game um, where you need to just feel a certain way or not feel a certain way. And Wind Waker still is that like, because it's one of those games, like I can either go on an epic adventure or I can derp around for six hours, just going from Island to Island and herding pigs and <laughs> fighting with my master on outside. I don't, do you remember his name, Mogan, the guy that trains uh, you? Oh, sh Orca, Orca, his name is Orca. Orca, yeah. So like just going and like trying to beat your best record of like the amount of hits you can get before you get hit. Um, and you get like certain items every time you break your record or whatever, like just spending an hour just doing that and just getting it out, getting out of a certain headspace. Um, that's why it launches all the way up to number one. And I think that speaks more to just the value of video games as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and just the, the, the part that's missed about video games from from the from the critic side, um, people who criticize gaming. It's just like, especially especially with the year that twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one has been like, yeah. <laughs> when you think of the value of video games and and mental health, um, and the role that they play, like, yeah, it's just it's unspeakable of how of how much of an impact they have, and so that's what launches ultimately Wind Waker up there for me is just that it is the game that I can go back to. Yeah. 
I Very completely nice. agree with a lot of what you said. Um, as far as soundtrack goes, I think Wind Waker has the best soundtrack out of all of list. the Zelda games. I'm going to have to put uh, that on my list to listen to tomorrow while I'm, while I'm working. There are so many good ones. Um, the Earth God's Ballad, the Wind God's Ballad, obviously a lot of the uh, uh, Outset Island. Uh, what's the... Oh my god, why am I blanking on it? Like the town where all the stuff is <laughs> like the main <laughs> island that you get to. <laughs> I can't remember what it's the called island right where all now. The, stuff is. the island where all the stuff is. You'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> yeah, it's like the merchant island. That's also where you meet Korox. Yes. The, at least yeah. the first game that I played, it's the first game with the Korox, which they yeah, are Yeah, this is the to. the first game with Korox, and they are one of the greatest things to ever come from the uh, Legend of Zelda series. You meet the Riddo, which are the bird people. They come back in Breath of the Wild. So Wind Waker set up so many fun things that have remained in Zelda games ever since. And I think a lot of people still don't know this or either don't remember this. When it came out, Wind Waker got a lot of flack from fans of the Legend of Zelda series because they were like, they made it for babies. Look at the art style. It looks like it's for children. So <laughs> it looks awesome. The art style, that cell shaded art style at the time was like very polarizing. A lot of people didn't play Wind Waker specifically because of the art style and those poor bastards really missed out you played yourself shot yourself right in the <laughs> foot with that one because you missed out on one of the best examples of a standard and unstandard zelda game i think where wind waker really clinched it for me was that much like with michael um it was one of the games that i played when i was like able to do them myself without the use of walkthroughs without having to have somebody come in and beat a boss for me and just it it was a game that i could sit down and play entirely on my own without needing help and that was you know that that, that always is going to put a game more strongly in your mind because you had to spend so much time thinking about it yourself uh and as far as god where was i going with this thought i just absolutely <laughs> lost my train of thought there <laughs> Uh, I don't know, just with that. more talking about why it's your favorite, I guess. Yeah, I'll just talk about why it's my favorite. Uh, I think the story itself is extremely charming. The world design is... Oh, that's where I was going! The world! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to go, I was going too far in, I had to go farther out. What really clinched Wind Waker for me as being such an incredible game was Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask started to go this direction but then wind waker took it to the to the nth degree in that the world was so much bigger exploration was such an integral part of wind waker in a way that it hadn't been in the previous games because in the previous games yeah you were always exploring your given area but they were very much areas it was always a feeling of okay now i'm in a field now I'm in the forest. Now I'm in the mountains. Now I'm in Hyrule Castle. Whereas Wind Waker was, no, you're on the high sea. You are in an ocean. Everything is connected. There are no borders. You just have to sail everywhere. And I personally, even when it took a long time, I loved the sailing mechanic. Don't care that it was slow. I thought it was fun. And even later on, when you get the ability to um, pseudo fast travel, I rarely used it. I was like, no, we'll take the long way. I'm going the scenic the route. <laughs> I'll take the high seas. Uh, I love the sailing mechanic. I loved the idea of being able to control the direction of the four winds. I adored. Wind Waker actually has my favorite design for the great fairies. They are so weird and alien in wind waker they have four arms for starters which that's fun and they have these really long weird tenderly hats they technically don't have legs and feet they're just they felt so incorporeal and otherworldly in a way that previous great fairies from the legend of zelda hadn't felt and honestly haven't felt since uh the the fairies in breath of the wild are wonderful i love them if you don't know what they are they're giant mermaid women and you can only see half of them because they're so big uh they their designs are incredible and i love them but oh when i've met i've met a fairy yeah you've I met know what a you're fairy. Talking about. they're, they're a in like the one of the big the big flowers and you have to like open. okay flowers. okay i know what you're yep. talking about a giant lady comes out of a flower mm. and she's like hey there handsome 
looking pretty good there. You want you want to smooch? <laughs> want to come over here? Link's like, oh, ma'am, I'm a minor. <laughs> Excuse <I think>. me. <laughs> Excuse me. I need an adult. Yeah, he does need an adult. <laughs> Very much so in that game. Uh, but th- that design is really fun. The fairy designs an ocarina of time in Bajora's mask. Let's just get it out there. Awful. They're not good. I understand that they're very interesting, but they're they're just not good. They're, I I hate them. Uh, I don't hate them, but I don't like them for sure. Whereas Wind Waker's, I love. And then the fact that Wind Waker had like a creepy little queen of the fairies and she was a child, but obviously infinitely old. It's just like, oh my God, you're really scary. (laughs) I'm super afraid of you right now. Uh, Wind Waker just had so many moments that were incredible to me. We talked about many years ago, I think in our first episode about moments in gaming, Mm -hmm. the moment where you complete uh, putting the... I don't know what you want to call them, Triforce orbs back into their statues and the three statues of the goddesses combine to raise up the Tower of the Gods from beneath the waves and open a path to ancient sunken Hyrule. God, what a moment. It, to this day, it like just sends shivers down my spine. I adore that part of the game. It's probably my favorite part of the game, period. Uh, and then Wind Waker also had a really, really fun boss battle. Uh, Wind Waker's boss battle is so fun. It's one of the ones where Ganon goes through various stages and every stage is a little bit different. Who doesn't love those kinds of boss fights? Because they utilize everything that you've gotten in the game up until that point. And then even in Wind Waker, Princess Zelda joined the fight. Tetra becomes Princess Zelda and then she's like, don't worry, Link, I've got these magical light arrows. You've got a shield that reflects magic light arrows, right? And Link's like, um, yeah. She's like, cool, here's the plan. I'm going to shoot at you, and then you deflect the arrows into Ganon. It's like, that's a little convoluted, but okay, I can get behind that. Yeah, why couldn't she just shoot them right into Ganon? Does it require the deflection? (laughs) Link has to create a distraction, you see. Two are better against one. And it is worth mentioning, Ganon is an adult, and in this game, Link and Zelda are literally children. So it probably would take both of them to take on a full-sized adult. Nice. Uh, and the Ganon in Wind Waker, speaking of him as a character, he had so much personality in Wind Waker. You really got a sense that he was an ominous force to be reckoned with. He actually felt scary. Whereas in Ocarina of Time... But Dingus with the giant nose? He's not scary at all. (laughs) Wind Waker Ganon actually felt a little bit scary. And Wind Waker had an ending that was actually a little bittersweet. Uh, Things didn't exactly go perfectly, and I think the game was better for it. Um, So it did in many ways have a happy ending, but it, it still kind of felt bittersweet in the end because ancient Hyrule remains flooded and it disappears forever. And it's basically like, okay, that Hyrule's gone. We now only have the tops of the ocean. Uh, Good luck to us. So I just (laughs) thought that it did a lot of interesting things with its story. Loved the gameplay. Loved the setting. The setting of the high sea, um, the great sea. One of my favorite ones still. So yeah, Wind Waker is an easy, easy number one for me. Very cool. Very cool. So this has been... You know, as someone like me who does not know as much about these games, I feel like I literally just got the definitive history of Legend of Zelda. In, it's probably you know, not definitive, but thank it's probably you. not <laughs> definitive. But I mean, I feel like I just like I understand it now. I feel like I could actually have a conversation with people about the games and everything and just the references, the characters and whatnot. And so I feel like that's a really awesome to get, especially especially considering the only game that you two shared was your number one which is pretty cool that you both shared your number one favorite game of all time uh, or favorite game of the legend of Zelda. And I kind of figured I like, I would talk a little bit about breath of the wild because that's the one I do have the most stuff with, but also I haven't finished it really at this point. So I don't really know if I could really add much than what I've already all said about it. Um, But so I don't really know if I want to take the time to do it, but I guess um, I don't know what were you going to say, Mogan? Sorry. I was just going to say, anecdotally, um, recently because of the winter storm, one of my friends had to come stay with me for a few days because her apartment didn't have heat or water, and I Mm -hmm. did. So she came to stay with me, and for her, I was like, we're bored. We don't have much to do. I'm going to delete 
my Breath of the Wild file because I'd already finished oh. the game. I deleted my old file and I let her start a new file. So Breath of the Wild is such a big game. You can't have more than one file at a time. Really? I thought you could. Mm -mm. Oh, all so, right. Well, I got to uh, be careful then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I let well, I her start. To play it yet. Exactly. Because <laughs> you don't uh, want to lose your progress and stuff. I I don't want to. I don't want to lose it. <laughs> I decided I, that I, I found like all but two shrines. I can't give that. Oh yeah, up. you don't want to lose that. No, <laughs> you got to go do all that. Yeah, you, you got to finish, finish up those that. shrines, man. I didn't um, get quite that far. There were many shrines that I didn't have. But to give you an example of kind of just Breath of the Wild in itself, so she was playing it, and then a couple of weeks after that, like here just recently, she texted me and she was like, "I had a dream about Breath of the Wild last night <laughs> because it gets in your skin." We we didn't yeah. talk about it in our top three, but Breath of the Wild is a wonderful game. I have sunk hundreds of hours into Breath of the Wild. I still get a lot out of it, just replaying it casually, just just derping around, mm -hmm. just derping around and admiring the scenery. So it is a wonderful game in its own right. It just doesn't happen to be in my top three. Yeah, and I mean, I'm enjoying it, especially now, for those unaware, I have been going back and playing it on my stream, which I need to get back to it. We've had, I had my, my week this week. I'm not getting to streaming because we've had a lot of recordings week, week before I was doing some like fundraising streams for uh, the winter's relief stuff or after the storm. And then obviously the storm itself. So I like fingers crossed next week, I should be getting back to it. And I've enjoyed it so much more this playthrough. And I think honestly, because it is because I've had the help of like Michael and Mogan and chat with me kind of directing me because even though it's an open world game and an RPG style of a game, it is, which I love that those types of games, it's different. Like it's way different than, than like the Assassin's Creed's or even like the shadow of Mordor's and, and different stuff that I've really focused in and played before. So I'm finding myself like having to really overcome this learning curve of the game. And I think that's what's had when I started the game, when I got it around, I guess when the game came out, um, I like, I kind of was off of it because I just felt like it, it doesn't have near as I think what I've, I saw somebody else say this on Twitter. I wish I had saved it so I could give proper credit to who it was, but they were also kind of talking about their struggles with, with the game being that it's just not as structured as other, as other games are. And I was like, that's it. I've been trying to say it for so long. Why I've had issues starting getting really into the game. And it is because it's less structured. You know, you, you do have a wealth of, things to go off and do in this world and in a massive world too. Like the map of breath of the wild is a big map. And so I just kind of felt like, you know, it, it became overwhelming at times. So now though the chat in Twitch is giving me that structure. And so I'm having so much more fun with it and actually able, because I'm not getting frustrated with those little things, I'm able to appreciate and see the things about it more. Like originally I was really turned off by that. Why does my sword break every two seconds? But now it's like pick, figuring out the quality differences, switching in between them, depending on what battle you're going for, taking in those moments where you are just listening to the soothing soundtrack in the background because i'll admit michael like what you were saying it's not one of my favorites either but hearing more of those just the gentle pianos and how it like slowly picks up when like an enemy comes by or something like that and how seamlessly it'll blend from those battle tracks back into the serene it and then also too just yeah the the overall look of the game the art style itself it's a beautiful game and it does have a lot so i'm seeing more of its promise and i'm seeing more of the things about it that are and captivating to people that people who are the fans of the series and just fans of the breath of the wild themselves are being like, Hey, this game's fantastic and it's good and it's great. And everybody should play it. And I'm finally getting those things and it's clicking with me, which is, I feel like is a pretty big, like I'm pretty excited about that for, for just myself and in my, you know, gaming experiences and that I'm finally like Zelda's finally clicking with me. And that is pretty exciting because now it does make me hearing, especially now after this episode, hearing your, both of your memories and thoughts and, everything on these other games. Like I want to go try Minish Cap. I want to try Wind Waker and to see all these different things and to experience them more and to get a better understanding of this fantastic series that has now gone on for 35 and hopefully goes on for another 35. Oh, so hopefully I guess 135 more. 135. Yeah, so that was going to be kind of the, I feel like that was going to be kind of the question I wanted to kind of wrap this up on then. What would you like to see next? I know we're getting Breath of the Wild too. And I understand that like, that's going to be some continuation, obviously of the breath of the wild story, but like, do you ever worry, I guess, of it getting stale of them kind of running out of ideas? What would you like to see them do? 
with Zelda from here on out for the next 35 years of its history. I personally, as much as I like Breath of the Wild, I would love for the next post Breath of the Wild 2, I would love for the next Legend of Zelda game to kind of be a return to form. I know a lot of people probably don't agree, but I would love another traditional Legend of Zelda game. Um, I would die if they made another top-down game like the handhelds. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that the DS, I think it's either the DS and the 3DS, I think is going out of production. So I don't know how likely that is, but I adore the styling of the handheld games, um, and I would love to see another one at some point. I don't care in what capacity. I don't really care what they do with the art style or what they do with the story. I just kind of want it to be a little bit more... Just traditional. Yeah, traditional is the, wor- is the right word. I have never yet gotten tired of the standard Zelda formula, and I kind of don't think that I ever will, because mm-hmm. it's an integral part of my gaming history and my gaming experience. Uh, there are many games that I've played over my life that, you know, were good, but that didn't stick. Zelda right. sticks for a good reason. Um, and I don't think that you need to necessarily fix something that at least in my view, isn't broken. I love that Breath of the Wild took it in a different direction and tried something new. I like it when Nintendo tries new wild things. Personally, my dream game is that we do eventually get, again, a traditional Legend of Zelda game with the twist that you actually play the entire time as Princess Zelda. Oh, that And cool. I think it would be really interesting if she had different abilities and kind of a different kit than Link traditionally does. I think that she would mostly use the bow uh, in all of the games where she actually gets a little bit of time in combat, like in Twilight Princess and in Wind Waker, she primarily uses the bow. You could also do so much with the fact that in Ocarina of Time, she's chic. She's a trained Mm. assassin ninja. Uh, There's so much that you can do there, but I do want it to kind of be not just chic because chic is very, you know, cool and like action-y. I want it to really highlight what's special about Princess Zelda as Princess Zelda. So that's a a dream of mine. And in my dream world, uh, because she represents the Triforce of Wisdom, her game would be more heavily embedded in puzzles. So Mm. that's that's something that I personally would like to see someday in in my dream. will never play it. (laughs) I'll never play it. If you're wanting it to be mainly puzzles, I'm out already. I'm already like, no, I'll just just skip over that one. No, 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 no. no. Her her game in my mind would be a lot more (laughs) stealthy. It would be a lot more based on sniping and then puzzles and stealth, uh, but but kind of in the Zelda format. A lot of lock picking? Yeah, a lot of lock picking. (laughs) A lot of stealing. (laughs) (laughs) I want it to feature a lot of stealing. A lot of lock picking and a lot of puzzles. <laughs> nice. Very cool. So, Michael, what about you? What would you like to see? Where would you like to see the series go from here? So a lot of the same thing. Like, I, I do love that they took the leap with Breath of the Wild to make it that open world. But also for me, like you've said, Jerry, it can just be too much. Um, and it's like I like to have direction to the games that I play. It's like it's why I'm taking forever playing The Witcher 3 because I... <laughs> Originally told myself I'm only going to do the main quest and that's it. No, that's I'm impossible. Doing every little side <laughs> bit, and so I want something with Zelda um, to just go back to that traditional form. And same thing as Mogan said, I would love um, the next iteration to be where you play as Zelda. Um, it's it's been and, 35 years. It's time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I kind of had my own thoughts of you know. I don't know if in your in your mind, Mogan, uh, when you're thinking through that, like if you're if you ever interact with Link as the as the hero of time, um, you know, and he carries the the courage part. In in my mind, I would like to see something where he doesn't exist at all, like he's supposed to, but either he doesn't show up because he's the chosen one that won't do his job. Or he dies at a young age or something like that. I don't know. But something where, you know, you're not expecting the hero to, sh- like, you're, you are expecting the hero sh- to show up, for Link to show up and save, to de- save the day. But he never does. And so Zelda takes it upon herself to embody both parts of that Triforce. Um, and so she kind of becomes, and, and it's kind of a blend, like, I don't want her to become... She can be chic all the time, but where she 
kind of like if she were to find like the hero's armor and wear it and like wear the green armor, but yet it be more stylistically um, towards Zelda and not just like straight up, like something like that where like Link's character doesn't exist at all. And for some reason, and I would like it to be because he just refuses to show up because he's an ass. You know, I just like <laughs> make it where women save the day because they do. And so it's just like, that's what I would love to see out of this. Um, and then also, I, I, I don't know what it would look like, but I would be curious just for, because I have the thought of from the Assassin's Creed, you know, they put Assassin's Creed Rogue where you play mm -hmm. as an assassin turned Templar. And so you see it from the other perspective. I would love to see a perspective that's from Ganondorf oh, and like really oh. kind of see like, like maybe try to build a storyline of what is his background? Because when you meet him in Ocarina of Time, I mean, you know, you know, he's part of the Guru tribe and that he is power hungry and he's wanting to have dominion over Hyrule. And that's kind of his character throughout all. He just wants dominion. I would like to see like what, I would like to see a character developed of why is it that he wants dominion? And I don't want like, and if they decide to go that route, I don't want it to just be like, Oh, well he's just power hungry and crazy. And that's all that matters. Like what is it about his character, about his childhood that is motivating him? Is there a reason why he thinks the world would be better off in his control? Aside from just the fact that he wants control. Like I'd love right. to see them really explore that range and that dynamic and almost in a sense like not make you feel bad for ganondorf but in a way that too where you see that perspective and then somewhere along the way he obviously goes off the deep end um but yeah i would love to see a game where like you play as like a child ganon ganondorf part of the time and you see the motivations like does the kingdom of because you know king the king of hyrule kind of gives off the vibe as you know colonizer and everything like that you know he's the he's the white man that's coming in to control and fix everything but you know that's kind of the that's the vibe that it kind of puts out so i'd love to see you know is the motivation why ganon has so much hate and heart in his heart is because the i pronounce it highlands but uh what wh because the highland army came in and raided his village and he's like i would love to see something from that perspective um, but yeah, so uh, a game where you play as Zelda, there is no hero of time. A game where you play as Ganondorf, I, I think those both would be pretty excellent. Yeah, I think those are incredible ideas. Um, that would be great. I, th that just goes to show that like they still have so much within their own universe to tap into. And I, my hope is that by playing with the formula with Breath of the Wild, that might encourage Nintendo to take some more non-traditional risks with the series in the way that exactly we described, just letting you branch out into the other stories contained within the existing lexicon. Uh, I think that would be wonderful. Um, and what? then at one point, I would like to play as a Korok, please. And I just want it to be... <laughs> A gardening simulator where you Is go like Stardew Valley, but you're but you're a coral. Exactly, exactly. Coral Is Valley. There... <laughs> See what Is, if? Is okay, so what if we? Game... Oh, oh sorry. wait, what did Michael yeah. say? I was just saying, is there a game where you play as Tingle? There is Tingle. <laughs> there, there are okay. spin-off games where Tingle and like is the. <laughs> they're weird. I haven't played any of them, but they're bananas. <laughs> Oh, Tingle. There needs oh, to be man. more Tingle. There so, does. So, so what if, though, in like Michael's scenario, I don't know if this works out, again, due to my just poor knowledge of the of the games as a whole, but I know there's a lot of, you know, time jumping, going back and forth in time, different timelines, whatever. What if the origin story for Ganon is that he was the greatest, the apprentice to the greatest potter in the lands? And at some point, his master is killed by the broken shards of an exploding jar from Link destroying it. And he then goes on this quest to find out who destroyed my damn jars. That sounds like it would be a game produced by the same people that made the Tingle spinoff. Oh, so there we go. See, they've already got the ideas. You those people and get them to make your game. Well, and his, his whole motivation would be to destroy the Triforce, not 
it'd be like a Thanos thing. I use the stones to destroy the. It's like I use the Triforce to destroy the Triforce exactly. and break it into shards because it broke my damn pots. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> oh man, that would I'd be hilarious. It. That would be great. <laughs> but but no, these are all fantastic ideas, and so. Nintendo, listen to us because again, we're a sponsored podcast and we have cloud now, but, <laughs> but still, this has been a fantastic deep dive into the legend of Zelda. And I think perfectly fitting for a celebration of such a established and well-loved franchise. So unless you guys had any further thoughts, I figured that was kind of a pretty good spot to draw this conversation to a close. Um, but so I, I did honestly, have one, oh, one more it. thing. I, I want to set no, you know, give a motion. Y'all can second it that we no longer call the Zelda franchise. We don't call it franchise or series. We instead call it the Zelda chain because mm. it's got a lot of links. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. I was just going with your craft in the story and it's a long yeah. story. You follow it. That's perfect. I love oh, it. I love you're, it. You're totally right. I mean, that's just like factually <laughs> correct. <laughs> we should, we should. <laughs> damn oh man that's good that's good we'll have to make that we will have to make that reality for team chat circles it's reality it's now the 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 chain the, the zelda chain, chain. Zelda, the zelda chain well obviously everybody listening please let us know what some of your favorite legend of zelda games are which ones rank the most in your chain of Zelda games? And just, you know, what are your, some of your favorite moments? Let us know in the comments. Send us an email at teamchatpodcast at gmail.com. You know, uh, comment on the YouTube videos, wherever you're listening and enjoying the show. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. But until next time, everybody, I think that concludes this special bonus episode celebrating The Legend of Zelda to a close. Until next time, I'm one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined across the internet by Rachel Mogan. Au revoir. And our special guest, Michael Boyd. Thanks for yeah. being with us, Michael. Thank you for joining us, Michael. It's really fun. Obviously, I love the Legend of Zelda. On. And it's always fun to be able to talk to another deeply passionate fan. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yes. Well, yep. We'll see you all next time and enjoy. Continue to enjoy the Legend of Zelda for another 35 years to come. We'll see you all next time. Mm-hmm.